So um, we're here at the Linaro Connect Vancouver 2018 and uh, who are you? Uh, I'm John Masters, uh, I'm a computer architect with Red Hat. And uh, you've been busy in the last year with uh, a whole bunch of stuff? Uh, yeah, I guess there's, there's two things that I do, uh, there's many things that I do for my day job, but uh, two areas this year I think have been uh, continuing the work on ARM servers, and we can talk a bit more about that, uh, and also uh, leading the um, security uh, response from a technical perspective to uh, the side channel attacks like um, speculative execution attacks like uh, uh, Meltdown, Spectre, um, recently Foreshadow, and, and a whole laundry list of different security vulnerabilities in modern processors, yeah. So wh why, did, why would you uh doing that well, how did you how did you become the person that does that uh, well or part of the team that does that yeah well so the backstory is that uh, for the last seven and a half years um, I've led Red Hat's work on um, the arm architecture and the um, the novel approach to how we've handled that is to work with a lot of silicon companies in the early days of building um, their microprocessors um, and this is before they've even taped out or produced the silica and turned the sand into a wafer and, and, and produced a microprocessor. And so we've worked very closely with design teams and we've done a lot of things that we haven't done in the past. And as a result, we have a, a expertise uh, in, in this space in terms of how processors are designed and how they behave internally. And a lot of us, like myself, who have a background in computer microarchitecture, um, have been involved. So I would guess I was the right guy <laughs> at the wrong time, <laughs> in the right place, you know? So, so, um, so the, effectively, we, 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 um, we uh, sensed that there was something going on last year, and so we started a, an effort a little bit in anticipation that there were going to be some problems in this space. Um, and it started with me writing an internal briefing on um, you know, the risks posed by speculative execution. And then uh, at the end of last year, in the fall of last year, I got Meltdown working um, in, a, in a reproducer internally uh, in advance of the disclosures. And of course, at that point, we were also starting to work with um, the, um, the partners uh, on, on mitigating uh, the, that problem, as well as many other vulnerabilities that have come out over the last year. Uh, and they've included, uh, very recently, something called Foreshadow, or L1 terminal fault. Uh, so we've seen a transition, really, in terms of the focus from the original set of vulnerabilities, which were very cross-architecture and impacted uh, all the computer architectures, um, to a few recent ones that have been more Intel-centric. Um, but I don't necessarily think this is exclusive. Well, we know it's not exclusive to, to Intel. Um, they've had some uh, focus recently from the research community, but this has affected everybody. So uh, we've tried to sort of, folks like myself, I wear an arm hat a lot of the time, but when it comes to security, I don't think you should play favorites or have a particular opinion other than just let's fix it and make it all safe for everybody. So um, I was able to sort of, you know, put my arm fanboy stuff aside and say, you know, let's go and try to help do something here. So that's been an interesting journey for the last year. And what I'm trying to do now is to get, um, still do some of that stuff, but also focus a lot on the ARM server work that we've been uh, driving for the past few years. But you weren't the one that found the, the, the meltdown bug, right? Uh, no, no, I was not. Uh, uh, we, we've worked closely with folks like the Google Project Zero team. Uh, and, um, you know, as I said, we, we had a heads up about some of these issues. Uh, and then we began some internal research uh, in anticipation of, in advance of some of the, um, you know, broader industry plans, right? Uh, so, so there was a there was an industry effort to mitigate these um, these um, uh, these exploits um, prior to January. And I think what we've learned over the last year is that we've gotten pretty good at responding to these. And, and so, um, even though your business card says uh, ARM. Uh what does it say? So it's chief arm architect. So, chief so arm architect. It, what it what it what it might say soon, I think, is uh, computer microarchitecture lead. Uh, so what I've what I've done over the last year, like I said, is try to broaden my focus out to include other architectures uh, and emerging architectures. So you know, we we look at uh, different. We look at x86. We look at um, both Intel and AMD. We look at um, the IBM architectures. We obviously 
have the arm work going on. That is my principal focus. Um, but we're also looking at some research around things like Risk Five and you know all kinds of different technologies out there. And what I'm trying to do is to make sure that Red Hat is always positioned uh, from a computer architecture point of view that we understand what's going on and we're able to see where the industry is going and when we have particular needs to address that we have the the right people uh, internally who can help help drive that. So you mentioned that Meltdown was not only an Intel issue but still mm -hmm. they were the most affected kind of rights. Well, the, you know, the way the way that uh, the way I put it is kind of how I've heard from the researchers if you want to get a paper published right now uh, what you do is you find a bug in an Intel chip, or you find a bug in a uh, an ARM core in a cell phone, right? So, it, you, you know, just given the the market penetration of some of the other players, um, th there there are fewer people out there with say a mainframe in their house, right, or something like this, right? So, if you're a researcher, you could go looking for all kinds of problems in different processors out there. But if the market, the, the, the main focus of, of people is on, you know, x86 laptops and servers and this kind of thing, and you want to publish a paper, then you've got a lot more likelihood of publishing a paper if you find a problem that you can say affects, you know, that particular processor vendor, right? So I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't say Intel is particularly, you know, bad from a security perspective, what I would say is that people are very incentivized to find problems with uh, that affect Intel because they can market that and they can say, you know, you need to see my paper, you need to see my logo, you need to see my, my research. And when I talk to a lot of security researchers, they are very frustrated about that as well because a lot of them would like everyone to care about security the same, uh, no matter, you know, who's affected by it. But the reality today is you know, you go find a problem that affects, um, you know, an x86 PC, or you go find a problem that affects Android or iOS. Uh, if you find a problem that affects, I don't know, the Plan 9 operating system running on a, an alpha, that's not really something that anyone is going to care about um, from a security point of view. And uh, so uh, it's very important for Red Hat to understand everything, how the chip, the CPU works and optimize all this uh, stuff that Red Hat is doing for the CPU itself. So, one of my focuses, uh, well, my one of my pet projects is to make sure that we solve this separation we've had in the industry between hardware and software people. So I was um, fortunate to be able to participate in the keynote at the Hot Chips conference last month, where uh, John Hennessy. Um, who's the president of Alphabet, right? Uh, so, and a, and a guy with a, a huge amount of experience. He literally wrote the book called Computer Architecture. Um, and he invented the risk. And he, inve and he, he, and, he and David Patterson, yeah. yeah, exactly, right. So, so you know, fabulous human being, great set of uh, expertise there going back decades. Um, it was really, really great to be able to just be a small part of his, uh, his keynote. Um, and I gave a, a, kind of my perspective from the software community on, on dealing with um, Meltdown and Spectre and other um, side channel microarchitectural vulnerabilities. And what I said was, hardware and software people don't ever communicate with each other. Um, some of us do, but generally speaking, if you're a software person uh, over the last few years, um, software people almost find it exciting to uh, ignore hardware people. If you read the Linux kernel mailing list, you will hear a lot of people say, well, that's just hardware, I don't care about that, right? Um, and so there has been a huge problem where we've made hardware kind of boring enough. We've got a couple of big vendors there who've kind of just taken the lead and driven it. And the software community doesn't care enough about how the hardware works. And so when we have these challenges and these problems, sometimes we don't understand what the problems are because, uh, you know, we've, we don't communicate, right? So uh, I've had a strong interest in helping to repair that uh, damage there and make sure that we do communicate and collaborate when it comes to uh, really understanding how machines work. And as a result of that, I think we'll get two things. We will get more secure machines. But we will also be able to build interesting new technologies because the machines of the future are not going to be like the machines of the past. Machines of the past, every year, every two years, you get a machine that's like, 
10%, 15%, 20% faster than um, you know, the, the previous generation. That isn't going to happen in the future. Moore's law is dead. We're not going to get faster and faster computers. So as a result of not getting faster and faster computers, we're going to have to build technologies differently in the future. We're going to have to build technologies that have software that doesn't use 10,000 layers of abstraction um, you know, and run really, really slowly, but instead write software that's more carefully optimized for the hardware. And also build hardware in collaboration with software so we understand how to build a complete solution. And that takes the kind of expertise and the kind of skills that we have uh, inside companies like Red Hat um, because we've invested in um, understanding how machines work. Is, is that also, it's very interesting that uh, as John Hennessy, who's the chairman of Alphabet, who's a trillion dollar company nearly, right? Yeah. Uh, one could think that maybe they're thinking about CPU a little bit now. And maybe, uh, I guess, maybe his speech is also like uh, what you just said, right? Uh, because maybe Moore's Law is not going to continue forever. So what's, what's next? Well, I think, you know, Moore's Law is dead, basically, right? It served us well, but it's, it's, it's gone. Um, and in many ways, that actually excites me personally, because I think over the last few years, we've had this kind of cheap performance improvement. So no one has really put the time into caring about, um, you know, building the best systems we can build, because they've just kind of gotten a bit faster each generation. And so if we can get to a point where people actually have to care about it again, that's good for everyone. It also means we have opportunity right now for innovation and for competition because, you know, you look at you know, manufacturing technologies, right? Nobody has a monopoly anymore on particular manufacturing technologies. So that's exciting as well. So there's lots of opportunity there. And I think any company um, that's, that's building out at scale or any company that's you know, kind of interested in, in, in the longer term is looking now and saying, what should we do? How should we respond? Uh, the, the idea that you're just going to have general purpose CPUs uh, everywhere uh, is obviously nonsense. And, you know, NVIDIA with CUDA proved that out, you know, more than a decade ago, right? To the idea that GP GPU is going to be a thing is, is, has, has turned into a big thing. We have a lot of special purpose hardware. Uh, machine learning has demonstrated the benefit that you get to having a lot of custom hardware, both for training and for inference. And you will see only more and more cases of custom hardware and custom accelerators. You know, and finally, look at the average phone. The average phone has more than 100 uh, different accelerators and widgets on that SOC in that phone. And this is because, you know, in order to get the battery life that you want out of that device and the experience that you want, you have to have this mixture. Um, of different accelerators alongside the general purpose compute. So you're working towards the heterogeneous uh, multi multi-processing systems? Yeah, so we're, we're interested in looking at this kind of heterogeneous future where uh, you don't just have, you know, more and more big, brawny, high-end processor cores, but you have a, a good combination of um, appropriately sized compute, right? So in many cases, maybe you have, uh, you know, GPU resources mixed with CPUs, maybe you have FPGAs, maybe you have other custom ASIC um, accelerators in your system, and they all have to talk together. You know, so one of the other things that I do is, is chair the um, software working group inside C6, which is a building a, a cache coherent uh, interconnect for acceleration. And this again lets you plug all these pieces together when you're building a server so that you can have your GPU or your machine learning accelerator share memory in the same way that a CPU sees memory. So there's lots of research going on on how to plug all these pieces together um, in future servers. So that's very exciting for the future servers, but there are some pretty awesome ones right there right now, which yeah. we've been looking at the Thunder X2 now for a little bit more than a year or two yeah. or something, talking about it, right? Um, potentially huge, 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 right? Well, I mean, that's, uh, our, that's what we are hoping. Yeah, uh, I would say the Thunder X2 is one of the first sort of, you know, mainstream quality ARM servers where you can take your existing workload on your existing high-end server and you can take that same workload and put it onto a Thunder X2 server and you can have the same kind of experience, right? Because you've got a two-socket machine, 
you've got a high number of cores, you've got eight memory channels uh, per, uh, per socket, right? Uh, eight memory controllers, sorry. So you've got the ability there to build a very, very high-end server uh, system with uh, you know, a terabyte of multiple terabytes of memory. Uh, and what that lets you do um, is it lets you really start to realize the, the promise we always had with, with ARM servers, right? The thing with ARM servers is until we get some of these really high-end machines, people running their very high-end workloads and they see that you know, we can do just the same as um, any other architecture, until they can really see that, then they're not going to look at the real promise of ARM, which isn't always going to be just the, the high-end machines, although those are important. There's, always, there's also all this opportunity in um, the edge, uh, edge compute, uh, and in, you know, sort of mainstream commodity, not super high-end, not super low-end, kind of that middle, uh, where, you know, hosting companies can start to offer you know, virtualized machines at, at scale. And you can see, for example, just last week, a company called Vexhost announced a uh, commercial offering in which they are going to be providing um, OpenStack-based virtualization um, where you can just get ARM-based VMs and deploy your workloads there. And I think that's an exciting uh, beginning. Uh, if you combine that with announcements, for example, uh, VMware announced that they have a release of ESXi uh, for edge compute. So you're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff happening, I think, over the next year or two. You'll see people uh, look at the success in HPC, look at the success of, of um, Thunder X2 uh, in the, in the ASP deployment, for example, for the national labs. They'll look at this and say, OK, that's an interesting uh, opportunity to use ARM, how can I apply that in many other scenarios? And the other scenarios, I think, are where you're going to see a lot more scale uh, at the edge uh, and in, in, in mainstream cloud computing. So at the supercomputing last time you announced the Red Hat Enterprise Linux was, uh, was 7.4? Uh, 7.5, yeah. 7.5, totally yeah. Uh, uh, ARM compatible from end to end, right? Everything, yeah. Yeah. everything just supported? Yep. Uh, so does that mean some of these uh, supercomputers and stuff, they might be using it? Uh, yeah, so I think it's uh, public record there that, that, that Astra is uh, uh, running a, a Red Hat-based operating system. Uh, and you, you'll see a lot more, I think, over time that uh, these supercomputers are, uh, the ARM-based supercomputers are running uh, RHEL or, um, you know, running Red Hat derived operating systems out there. Yeah. Astra, is that the one from uh, Sandia, the, the, the Sandia Thunder machine. X2 supercomputer that was announced? That's the Sandia machine, yeah. That's exciting, right? Yeah, it's super exciting. I, I'm, I really enjoy working with that community of people on, uh, you know, on, on these technologies. And like I say, it's just the beginning. Uh, what you saw at supercomputing last year was kind of, in a sense, a deliberately boring announcement, right? It's just, here's a RHEL offering, it just works, you can go to HP and you can buy an Apollo 70 from HPE right now um, that you can just get RHEL for it, right? Well, that's fabulous. That's the same experience you would have on, say, an x86 HPE Apollo platform. Um, but what you're going to see going forward is you're going to start to see some of the layered technologies that run on top of RHEL. For example, we are building uh, you know, demonstrations at this point of various container technologies. So, for example, we have, you know, of course we have OpenStack up and running, of course we have Ceph and other technologies, but we're starting to look at things like um, OpenShift and various container platforms. Uh, are we going to ship those yet? No, but uh, what we do is we, we get them up and running, we explore, we, we look at how, how well that software works, and in most cases it's just a case of, you know, kind of maybe changing one or two things, building it up, and more or less it just works, right? We, we have, we've reached a point in the ARM server space where things are, you know, pretty much fabulously boring, right? There are some differences from x86 or power or any other architecture, but not many. And over the next few years, you're going to see increasingly an opportunity for people to deploy, for example, uh, uh, an ARM-based container and for developers to not even have to care what the architecture is. I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a uh, coffee shop, you know, startup entrepreneur developer, and I'm writing in Node.js, right? Uh, and I'm used to using containers to do that. There's no difference for me, from a developer point of view, deploying an x86 container today, or deploying an ARM-based container, 
right? So over the next couple of years, you're going to start to see, as we get these bigger deployments, as we start to see, you know, cloud opportunities like the VEX host uh, announcement we just saw, you're going to start to see developers looking at this and saying, that offers me, you know, maybe a, maybe a price benefit, maybe some other benefit, maybe um, access to more ARM servers closer to me in an edge kind of scenario. And they're going to say, well, I, I have my, my software. It's just a Docker container. It's just a Docker file that says pull these pieces together. And I just hit one button and have my ARM based container and deploy that instead. And it's very, very easy. So, uh, for example, KVM, uh, I mean Marvel, sorry. Yeah. Uh, they're saying that maybe in terms of power, it's actually not less than the Intel. But is it is is it the price that is an advantage, or is it customization that is an advantage, or? Well, I think it's a very good question. So I think uh, there will be cases where ARM is uh, more price competitive. So, for example, in the edge compute scenario that I described, where you're deploying very close to the edge of the network, maybe you have a smaller machine. Uh, it has a, a good amount of RAM. It has a good number of cores but it's trying to build something that is less, uh, you know, than, than, than the, the, the big brawny, high-end, uh, you know, compute systems that you, you, you see out there today. Because today you see kind of a one-size-fits-all, right? Whatever the answer is, whatever the question is, the answer is, you know, just put this there, right? That's how we build machines today. So they have very high-end parts, but they have high cost, uh, and the economics are not always great. So you can build machines that are more appropriately sized for the workload. So that's going to be interesting. That'll give you pricing um, that really starts to make this compelling. For some of the other cases, nobody has a monopoly on the laws of physics. So no one can say, oh my goodness, my transistors are you know, way better, right? So uh, it, as a consequence, even though the ARM architecture is more energy efficient and more performant in that, in that way, um, it's only a few percent difference using, you know, RISC versus CIS constructions or something like this. And the reality is, if you're building a very high-end core, uh, you're still going to use a lot of power to do that, right? Um, so if you're building HPC, maybe you're not going to save a lot of power, but you're going to be able to do some different things. So Cavium and uh, now Marvell, what they can do because they're focused in a particular market segment and they're not trying to sell a part that solves the entire world's problems in one go, they can say, well, we're going to put, you know, eight memory controllers in here and we're going to be able to give you a ton of memory in this machine and we're going to build a really high-end interconnect. Maybe they're not trying to put that part into a laptop, which is some, what some of the others are trying to do with the same design. And so that means they can build something that, that aims more towards the higher end of the market. Um, at the same time, others, can come along and say, well, that's great. We're not going to try to do HPC and high-end cloud, but we're going to do edge compute, and we're going to take ARM's own cores, which are pretty good, and we're going to put them into a much smaller edge case uh, scenario. And if we do that, then we're going to get really good economics, really good power, and we're going to uh, try to address a different part of the market. So really, it's the whole ARM uh, ecosystem playing out and saying that there isn't one right answer the only time I think there's one right answer is when it comes to standardization. So because we have built standards for these platforms, even though they may be big, little, in between, uh, they can all run the same software. But the, the ultimate promise, kind of, of, of the ARM, which was in the beginning was kind of like a surprise for the inventors and stuff, was that it's potentially much less power consumption, yeah. which is crucial for enabling amazing cloud application for everybody, right? So maybe there will be a power advantage I think there's okay. some, I th it's a good question. I think there's some power advantage, right? It's, it, it's definitely true that there is some power advantage. But when you're looking at a very high-end HPC scenario, uh, it, you know, there's, there's so much other energy use there beyond just the core that, uh, you know, the, 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 the absolute energy uh, is, is, is lower, but not a lot lower. However, when you're building a, a more mainstream, you know, edge or, or kind of middle market server platform and you're using ARM's cores and you're really going for that right sized dynamic, I think you can save significant energy in your design. But I don't think energy alone is, is the reason people are looking at ARM. I think people are looking at ARM for um, supply diversification, right? 
because I can, I can play vendors off against each other. Um, but they're also looking at it and saying, I can go to this vendor and I can say, I need you to do this. I need this accelerator or I need this security capability or you know whatever it is, right? And because there are multiple vendors there, you can, you can kind of play them off against each other and get what you want. Uh, in the traditional space, you have one or two big guys, and what they have to do is they have to service everybody with the same solution. And that's very difficult uh, in, in the world we're going into. So much so that I think a lot of the big guys now, they focus on the six or eight or ten big cloud customers they have. And um, if you're a smaller uh, you know, cloud uh, vendor, you know, cloud provider, uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, they care about you, but you buy fewer parts. So uh, maybe if you use an alternative, you're going to be able to get uh, you know, more of what you want. By, by using some of these alternatives out there where, you know, yeah, you don't buy as many chips, but you buy quite a few. And for some of the new players coming to market, uh, that actually works well for them in their economic model. And uh, uh, so, so right here at the conference, there was, uh, um, uh, there was an, like just a couple of days ago, um, there's, a, there's a new uh, chip available, the EMAG, right? Oh, yes, That's yes. exciting, right? And there's, oh, yeah. uh, there's Qualcomm Centric, so what's up, what are your opinions about those? Well, I think there's a couple of announcements we've had this week. So we had uh, Fujitsu announce their FX64 uh, part, right? So um, the Fujitsu part is particularly interesting because that's going into the post-K supercomputer. You know, it's been uh, a great pleasure to visit Kobe and see the K computer in person. Uh, and then uh, to talk with the team about the post-K design for the past few years and, and now they're starting to talk more publicly about what's going into that. So how does it look in the K computer? Is it huge? Oh it's it's massive. I mean it's you, bigger than this room? Oh sure. Yeah it's a well, it's a it, it's actually on many different floors. If you get a chance to go to Kobe oh. it's really cool to see it because the the computer's kind of in one giant hall like a data center, but they also have like a whole other floor for storage and they got Whoa. some really cool technology in there, and they've got a, a you know, power, not power generation, but they've got you know storage systems on site. They also have this really cool um, earthquake uh, shock dampening system, right? So because because of Japan, of course, is subject to earthquakes, right? The whole building is actually suspended, so if they have an earthquake, uh, it's still fine, right? Up to some crazy high magnitude, it's 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 safe. Um, so it's really cool to see that, and it's really cool to work with the team on what they're building. So Fujitsu was here at Lenara Connect talking about their um, their SOC that's going into this machine. It's a huge chip. It's a big chip. I mean, they a lot say of it's the biggest processor in the world, or is it the biggest ARM processor in the world? Uh, it's, it's, it's so far, I think, the, they're claiming to be the highest performance ARM processor that's been built. Uh, but most of these chips today are very physically big because <coughs> they have a lot of uh, <coughs> pins coming off them, a lot of I.O. So even though the, the, the die inside might be actually small, <laughs> the package tends to be pretty big. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty big. Uh, uh, it's um, you know, definitely uh, uh, very interesting. Um, and we also saw this week, like you said, the, the Ampere uh, EMAG announcement. So Ampere have announced their... Uh, so Ampere uh, is a startup uh, founded by uh, Rene James, who used to be the president of Intel. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rene, a, she's a really great person. She's got a really good team. She's got Atik, who has a, a huge history in... Uh, leading the design of high-end microprocessors. But it, um, who's that? Who Atik, he also came from Intel, uh, and, and and various others on the team that we've worked with uh, as they've gotten the the uh, the Ampere organization up and running. So Ampere kind of started out uh, based on um, acquiring the assets of Applied Micro, but also pulling in a lot of these other industry veterans uh, and then folks you know from other companies who've joined, and so they've built up this really cool base of engineering. And they've taken the, the roadmap that, that was at Applied Micro, they've brought that, what used to be X-Gene 3, to market in, uh, in the EMAC, EMAC. In, their, in their first what generation. What do they call it, EMAC 1? What do they call yeah, it? I think they call it EMAC, but I guess maybe we'll probably call it EMAC 1 in the end, right? But, oh. but it's just the beginning. They're, they're working on a cool roadmap uh, with some really cool stuff in the future. And so this is them saying, here's a really credible ARM server. Uh, and it is really credible, it has really good performance. It's not gonna give you the best performance you've ever seen, because that's not the point. The point is they're going after the middle of the market, so it's a really good processor to put into your data center or your cloud environment. 
you know, you might not want to put it in a supercomputer, but that's not where they're aiming it. They're aiming it directly at that middle. It's got good pricing. It's got good scalability. It's just right for that part of the market. That EMAG now? That EMAG. The, yeah. the list price is $850. And actually, uh, uh, XGene 3 is a big jump compared to XGene 2, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, that, that particular part is very performant. Um, but as I said, it's just the beginning. Now, the nice thing about that part, though, is it's fully standard. So when we first got them, we've had them for quite a while, when we first got um, these parts in-house, uh, getting our operating system up and running, uh, I think it took maybe 30 seconds, maybe mm -hmm. maybe a minute, you know, the first time. You basically just take the operating system, because we've driven all of these standards, the SBSA, the SBBR, the, the, the various ARM server standards, because our OS is compliant to these standards, and so is the hardware, it's just like x86. You just take your operating system and you boot it on the hardware. And then sometimes you have you know, a need for a driver for some I.O. adapter or something like this. Um, and so occasionally you will have to make some changes. But generally speaking, we've made the process kind of just as boring as x86, and that's deliberate. So you can just take a new part you've never seen, like the EMAG, and you can boot on it. Uh, and in that particular case, it's, it's such a cool platform because it, it, it really does just look like an x86 machine. You've got a high-end um, a set of cores, 32 cores, right, over 3 gigahertz, and you've got tons of PCI. So you can just plug in, you know, PCI network adapters. We plug in, you know, Mellanox cards, you know, SAS storage adapters, Mellanox um, and, 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 and uh, uh, InfiniBand connectors and, uh, um, you know, uh, Intel E1000 network cards, you right. name it, we try it all out, right? And it just works. Um, and GPUs? this, oh sure, yeah. People yeah. people have tried all kinds of GPU technology in there too. Now sometimes with the GPUs, we have a few driver issues to work out, right? But this is true on, you know, uh, <laughs> I have yet to find any architecture where uh, there isn't some issue trying to ship an, an NVIDIA driver or something like this, right? So, so you get the same kind of challenges as you get with, like, you know, an x86 server having to install a, uh, a set of binary blobs to get some GPU working. Unfortunately, it's not better um, there, but it's not really that much worse. Um, and people are working on solving these problems for, for ARM as well. Uh, can you say, what's your latest opinion on the Qualcomm centric? Because Qualcomm is a huge, cool company, right? Yeah. Uh, there was, uh, well, sometimes, uh, you know, there were, there's all these, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, what's it called, the, the, the industry is a little bit crazy sometimes. Yeah. Uh, even for huge companies, uh, people trying to acquire them and then all these uh, talks and stuff. But they're definitely uh, full on, full, full going forward with this chip, which is a cool one. Yeah, so I... Think? Well, so I think I think uh, it, it it it's uh, it's an interesting world we live in. Uh, but you know, if 2018 was an interesting year for those guys. They had you know a couple of people try to buy them. All kinds of craziness going on, right? So, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, Centrique is is um, is a really good product, and uh, it's got great performance. They got a great, uh, you know, the follow-on to that. Uh, ten nanometers. Oh yeah, it's a great. It's a Intel great. Intel doesn't have any ten nanometer server chips, right? Well, depending on who you talk to, that they'll say, well, you know, kind, of, you, yeah. you know, yeah. But uh, um, yeah, one thing I would say on, on the nanometer thing is, uh, you know, Intel's ten nanometer is different from somebody else's ten nanometer, right? So kind of where we are today. Intel's 14 plus plus or whatever node they're on now plus 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 or who knows right whatever um, Intel's 14 nanometer node is similar to the foundry uh, 10 nanometer node right so while that while that 10 number is better than what Intel's number is um, I think in terms of the process the silicon technology it's basically the same process right but but the huge thing there is uh, we had we had an industry where you had this one player that basically had the you know the whole thing sewn up in terms of having the best process on the planet, right? And now you're seeing the foundries competing with basically the same level of um, process technology. So this means that someone like Qualcomm can come along and they can say, yeah, we can make a chip just like the other guys, right? A nice so, big chip. A nice big chip. But so what it means is they can now compete on the architecture. Right? Previously, you had to compete on manufacturing, uh, with, you know, the actual building of it, and on the architecture and the microarchitecture, the design. Well, now, 
you're, you're going into a time where, you know, TSMC, for example, have a really good seven nanometer technology that everyone's looking at, right? So when, when people start to bring out uh, TSMC-based seven nanometer designs, you saw Apple announce the, uh, the A12 uh, just recently for their phone. That's the first high volume seven nanometer uh, part, but you'll see a lot more, I'm sure. As people start to roll those out, that will be at least as good or maybe better than some of the other guys uh, manufacturing. And that means that now we can compete on the architecture itself, the actual design inside there. Uh, and we can compare apples to apples, right? Or oranges to oranges, rather than saying, well, here we've got a, you know, X-Gene 1, which was great years ago. X-Gene 1 came out and it was 40 nanometers and Intel was on 28. It's very hard to compare when you're a few generations behind in manufacturing. But now we're at a point where people are bringing out server processors um, on ARM, and they're bringing them out at the same level of manufacturing, or potentially even better than the other guys. So that's going to let us do much more direct comparisons and, and hopefully have much higher performance. So uh, it's exciting what they have now, but it's also exciting just to kind of, because you do that, think what might come in the future from these guys. Because right. uh, who knows? And uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to try to get any secrets or anything like that, but uh, I'm sure it's exciting too. But it would be nice to see what's there yeah. become big already. Well, I think, I think the thing for me is uh, this was always going to be a 10-year journey. So um, I uh, am very grateful to the Red Hat management for letting me start the ARM project inside the company. Formerly, I think it was March 1, well, I know it was March 1, 2011. That was when we started the project, right? Um, and we did some work before that too. But... Um, I always thought it would be a 10-year journey going into about 2021 before ARM servers were just something that everybody could buy. But this year, they are something that people can buy. Like, like real credible, you know, well-performing ARM servers, you can go and get a uh, Cavium Thunder X station right here, a workstation with a high-end, you know, really good a couple of processors in it, a couple of sockets. Uh, you can get that now. You can get other uh, vendors selling the Thunder X2 uh, today, right? HPE have an Apollo 7 you can go and get. And you have Packet.net where you can get access to these machines. So we're starting to see uh, availability and adoption of this hardware. And what's going to happen over the next couple of years is that's going to then grow. And you're going to see some very interesting things happen. So between now and 2021, I think you're going to see um, a lot of changes and people really kind of getting to where we always thought we would be. But we always thought it was a 10 year journey. And uh, so uh, what happens, uh, what do you do in the Linara Connect? What's your day to day uh, activities? Is there a lot of meetings or yeah, so talking I, about what? Yeah, so I sit on the uh, data center group steering committee and also the technical steering committee for Lenaro. So that's two different groups, the two different steering committees. Uh, and then I go to some of the talks and have lots of other meetings as well. And of course I have my day job going on at the same time. So, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of kind of scurrying around and meeting with lots of people and catching up on particular projects. Uh, and then also helping to drive the strategy for where the data center group inside Lenaro is going, for example. And we're, we're now called the data center group. We used to be called LEG, the Lenara Enterprise Group. And we renamed ourselves the data center because we wanted to really focus on, you know, the, the, that data center component. Uh, and the word enterprise kind of had, had people thinking of maybe, you know, the wrong connotation there, right? So data center is, is much broader. It includes cloud. It includes lots of use cases. Um, and then also edge computing. And, um, and so what we do there is we drive the strategy. Well. I just want to point out that that, um, that that group is now six years old. In, a, in another couple of months, it will turn six. And in that time, we have driven a lot of the standardization work. We've gone from upstream Linux having no support for ARM servers to now having great out-of-the-box support for ARM servers. And, and it's been basically just you know, playing whack-a-mole, right? Every time one little thing comes up, you got to get, you know, get rid of it and you got to kind of just solve this one bit at a time. But now, all the foundation is there. So upstream Linux is great, but we, we just in the last week had a blog post go out with the OpenStack Foundation where Hammer from uh, the Data Center Group, she wrote a, a great write-up of the work that's happening in Lonaro on, uh, on the Rocky release, right? So OpenStack Rocky, it just works. It, it's a first-class citizen. All the tests pass on ARM. Well, that's great. 
But what is the Rocky? Rocky is the latest release of OpenStack. So <laughs> that just works. But the, even better than that just working is Lenaro have been leading the work to containerize that. So there's a project called Kohler, K-O-L-L-A. And in Kohler, what they're doing is they're containerizing the OpenStack components so you can just deploy them. You know, you just take a server, a, an ARM64 or AR64 machine, or uh, just your x86 machine. You could do this side by side if you want to, right, for comparison. And you can just use your standard container deployment technology. You can use Ansible playbooks, which is a way of just easily automating this. And you can just kind of have type one command and deploy OpenStack on a machine. For example, in, in, a, in a lab environment, if you want to do an all-in-one config, a test config, you can just run a playbook that will automatically install all the pieces for you and give you a machine that's just working. And it's very similar to deploy this at scale. So Lenaro have a, a developer cloud that they built, and they use this Kohler container technology to actually deploy their own cloud as well. Um, and, and that's just an example of kind of the cool work that's happening in the data center group. So it's going beyond getting the bits working in upstream Linux and now delivering these layered technologies, things like OpenStack. We're working on container technologies. We're working on storage. We're working on HPC. We're working on big data. So lots and lots of different pieces and it's all starting to come together uh, really well. But now for a while already, uh, the whole industry has basically regarded Lenaro as a huge success, right? I think so. I mean, I think Lenaro has been fabulously, su fabulously successful at its goal, which is to uh, solve the open source challenges that ARM had and caused, you know, back in the day, Linus Torvalds to, to rant about, uh, you know, ARM's status in, in Linux as kind of not being that great, right? Well, now ARM is really a, a really good citizen in open source and in uh, in Linux and other projects, and Lenaro is a huge part of how uh, that has happened. Okay, so looking forward to to what happens in the future. Yeah, it's exciting, and uh, you're right there on the on the where it's happening. Well, that's how I like it. I like to be right in the middle of it. So uh, thanks for talking. It's really good. Thanks.